If I could answer that, I think I'd be rich. <clears throat> yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I, I'm asking this out of ignorance because I don't know the answer to that either. And a warm welcome back to Success Back, the Success Factory. My name is, of course, Felix Becker, and I am your very own success coach on this journey we call life. Now, I am here to help you succeed in life and business. But there are so many amazing people out there who do some incredible work to make the world a better place for all of us. And I want to share with you who these people are, what they do, and how they can help you become extraordinary. And this week is no different. Christine Porter helps women become free from alcohol. It's a topic that is near and dear to my own heart because my brother is a raging alcoholic. The conversation was raw, was honest, was vulnerable. You truly get to listen in to Christine's own journey through life with alcohol and now without. How she is helping other women and empower other women to become free from alcohol. It was an incredible conversation. You're gonna get a lot out of this. It truly tucked in my heartstrings. And I'm sure you can hear that in my conversation with Christine as well. Now remember, if you like this kind of stuff, please like, rate, review, share this story with people who could benefit from hearing Christine's story. Share the story with women who are suffering from alcohol. But let me get all this mumbo jumbo out of the way and let's just get right in to my conversation with Christine Porter. Christine, so nice to see you. Let's get right into it. Who are nice. you? Nice to see you. Yeah, so who are you? Who am I? Well, I am a entrepreneur, mother of two, mother of three fuzzy dogs, a wife, a inquisitive creature who likes to explore all kinds of fun options. And one of those fun options I'm exploring right now is becoming a coach for people, for women who struggle with alcohol. Wow. That's, uh, that's uh, a lot. So uh, that's also going to be a topic that's uh, somewhat near and dear to my heart. Uh, not necessarily woman part, but the struggling with alcohol because my brother is a just absolute raging alcoholic and I honestly don't know how to help him. So uh, let's, uh, let's get back to the beginnings. How did you get to be where you are today? Well, my story starts with um, my own tragedy, if you'd like to put it that way. Um, <clears throat> I, I think my drinking started um, long ago and didn't, I didn't realize that it was creating a problem. You know, the typical weekend drinkers go camping, drink, you know, don't work, don't drink all week, just go back to work and you're surviving. And then I suffered a major depression. I went through a real down time. And the only thing that got me out of my bed was a glass of wine. And that glass of wine continued to be two glasses of wine, continued to be a bottle, continued to be two bottles um, on a daily basis. And finally I broke and decided I didn't want to live any longer. So I was intent on taking my own life and I wasn't successful, thank God. Um, I'm here to tell the story that, um, but it was a huge wake up call for me that I don't remember any of it. Like I don't remember wanting to do it. I don't remember the action. I don't remember any of it. I just remember waking up in the hospital. So, um, it was a huge wake up call for me and I decided I needed to do something about it. So I went to rehab and I went to AA, neither of which worked for me because my mindset was not where it was supposed to be. I was trying to quit alcohol because I had to quit alcohol, not because I wanted to quit alcohol. So after the first round, I started drinking again and it got worse. If it was possible, it got worse. And it went about nine months and I decided that I had to do something about it again. So I went back to rehab with a different mindset and I came out looking for a different answer than AA. Willpower was not enough for me. Willpower just didn't seem to be 
an answer that's working for most people. It's like a daily struggle, you know, like you're suffering every day to give up alcohol. I didn't want my life to be like that. So I went in search of other means to stop drinking. And I found a program that dealt with um, beliefs and the substance itself and all kinds of other different aspects of alcohol that suddenly worked for me. And I finished the program was the 12 month program and I finished it while I was doing it. I started studying to become a coach because I wanted to help other people. Other people needed to find out that there was a different way. And I was determined that I was going to help women like myself get out of that rut and do something. Um, so I was, I started in college while I was still completing that program. And I did that. I did a six month uh, program with Rose Wells Wellness College in Vancouver, British Columbia. And I did an advanced coaching course with um, the Alchemy Academy. And I licensed my business and started rolling. Yes. And here I am today. Wow. <clears throat> what a story. Uh, Christine, thank you for sharing, for being vulnerable. Uh, that's quite the journey. And uh, I, I guess I should add for myself, it's not just my brother. I mean, my, my brother is still the, the alcoholic in the family. I have had depression for probably most of my life and I've had my own suicidal thoughts uh, in, in my own life multiple, multiple times. And uh, I also, you know, I'm thankful that I didn't act on any of the urges that I had. So uh, it, the struggle is real. Uh, and there's, like you said, there's so many people out there like us uh, who are struggling, uh, who we can potentially help to get out of those dark spaces. Uh, and, and there's definitely things that I haven't quite figured out yet for myself, uh, how to make that happen. Um, but, uh, it's, it's a work in progress. And like you said, ultimately it's a mindset. Um, how do you, uh, you know, and I guess with the mindset too, the first thing is, is recognizing that you have a problem and you need help. So, uh, I, I want to get a sort of a better idea for what was going on in your life um, wh when you were going through all of that. Were there external sources of pressure? Uh, you know, did you have a demanding job or a uh, bad family life? Or was there anything external to all of this that was driving that, or, or maybe not driving, but fueling your alcohol intake at that time? Definitely. Um, <clears throat> major stress <laughs> for one, but I just being that typical mother who feels she has to do it all. Um, I was raised in a family of 14 kids. <laughs> My mother was a lot older than I was and she was old school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and she was quite old school. So the, the, the matron of the house did everything. And I raised my children. Um, I was married, I'm married to a retired member of the RCMP, which is the federal police force here in Canada. And uh, we would be re re relocated every four years. They would up and move us every four years. That's just kind of, kind of like the military, like how it would go, you get moved. Um, so a lot of the, op I didn't have a lot of opportunity to work because we'd get moved every four years and we'd just get settled and whatnot. So I raised my kids. Uh, which I'm grateful for that I was able to be with my kids and raise them. And once they were in school and whatnot, then I went back to work. Um, but then it was still my responsibilities. And I just, like I said, I had my mother's mentality there that I was supposed to do it all. So I was working. Um, I took a job with uh, Canada Post uh, because it fit the schedule. And I was a letter carrier for a while. And that job, Everybody says, oh, what a great job to have. And so, yeah, it's a great job to have in the summertime because you walk. But I used to walk about 20 kilometers. <laughs> used to walk about 20 kilometers a day. So I'd be exhausted by the time I came home. And then I'd come home and have to do it all and take the kids here and do this and hockey practice and volleyball practice. And, and it just, the world kind of caved in on me. I think I just finally gave up and realized I couldn't do it all. And that's kind of when I had my breakdown and my depression. Um, we were building a house as well. <laughs> so that's always another stress. Um, my relationship with my husband, we, well, we weren't having, you know, there wasn't any, um, problems within the marriage, just the typical fighting because we're building a house, which they say building a house can cause divorce sometimes. <laughs> so, <laughs> 
So, so, uh, but, but we managed to survive that. So, uh, yeah, it was just, for me, it was the pressures of life. I'd come home, have everything to do, pour myself a glass of wine. And that would take the pressure off for me, right? It's like just, just for 20 minutes, it would ease that just gnawing at me. And if I could have stayed at that one glass, it would have been okay. But that one glass felt so good that I had to have another glass and another glass. And then my responsibilities went to hell in a handbasket because I didn't want to do anything after I've had a few glasses of wine. Oh, the heck with you. Get your own supper. When where's my uniform? I don't know. Where did you leave it? Well, it's not clean. Okay, go wash it. You know, like I, got, I, I went from super mom to mom who doesn't give a shit, right? So... <laughs> So it kind of progressed down that path. And then when I crashed, I crashed. And um, I didn't drink for a while when I crashed. I just basically didn't even get out of my bed. But when I did, it was only the wine that got me back out of my bed. So, Yeah. No, that's, um, uh, that is uh, just so raw and real and visceral. Uh, I mean, listening to your story, I mean, it just kind of gives me chills. So, um and I'm coming at this maybe from a bit of a selfish perspective. Uh, and I say this because uh, my brother, who is infinitely more smart than I am, uh, he, I mean, he could have had a, a phenomenal career in automotive engineering, and he just kind of threw that in the wastebasket. So he always says, I know I need help. And he's been offered help on numerous occasions. He's been on the doorsteps of, of rehabs uh, in, in very, various programs. And he has never really stepped foot into them. Even when he did get into a program, give him a few days, he sobered up, he's out of there again. So what made that different for you? Like you, you also knew you needed help, but you went the extra step. You took those extra 20 kilometers, if you will, to make it through that. So what was that, what was that decision, that motivation for you to go through with it? For me, it was the desire. I did not want to drink anymore. And to rid myself of an addictive substance was going to take some determination and, and guts. And I knew that. And one, once I, what I find with, with people, like the first time I went through it, I didn't really want to do it. I was doing it because I had to. So once I became sober, I mean, I did rehab for almost four weeks. I had four, you know, I had that under my belt and came out and struggled, struggled for three months, just every day. Like, you know, sometimes in tears and my husband <clears throat> wanting to go buy me a bottle of wine because he knew how miserable I was. But the second time around, it was like, it was my mindset. I wanted to do this. So I knew that I had to buckle down and do whatever was required of me to become clean and sober and not go back to it. Um, it's really easy. It's really, really easy to think after, you know, oh shit, well, I can, I've just done four or five days. I can do this. No, you can't do this because the brain, the neuroplasticity in the brain is wired to want the alcohol. It wants that dopamine rush from the alcohol. So you have to change your mindset and you have to change your lifestyle. You have to start doing things naturally to get that dopamine rush. Now that takes a little while, but you have to put in the work, right? Yeah. No, absolutely. And like, like with anything in life, if you want to achieve anything big or major, it's going to require some work and there's definitely challenges along the way. So for anybody listening to this episode who, who relates to your story, uh, what, what kind of spark of motivation can you give them that there is hope, that there is a better life, that there is something else waiting for them other than what is going on in their lives right now? Well, the, like part of what you just said, that there is help. There is a way out. Um, you know, you have to, they don't have to feel lonely. They don't have to feel like it's all, you know, that, that they're by themselves trying to, trying to deal with this stuff. Every, there's so many people that are trying to deal with this. It's, it's just a shame. Um, you know, and it takes so many lives. Like there's, I was just doing some stats up for a client and he was just curious. And there was, um, the latest stats came out at 3 million people a year are killed by alcohol. 3 million, you know, like that's, and, and it's not, 
like you were talking about your your brother and and how he gets steps in and, and it's not his fault because of the brain because of the way the brain gets wired he, you know the subconscious is ruling i mean we don't know that the subconscious is ruling but it is ruling you know our conscious brain only deals with about two things at a time our subconscious brain deals with so much more and it's the subconscious that's ruling that little lizard that lives in that you know reptilian brain i call it comes out and says no i want that drink so in terms of a spark you know the spark kind of had that the spark kind of has to get lit within they have to they have to really they in their hearts they have to want it because you can't you can lead a horse to water but you can't make them drink right no that that is so true and unless the water is laced with alcohol i suppose <laughs> <laughs> um yes <laughs> Um, no, but so if you think about it, there's really only two areas of motivation, gen generally speaking, for us humans, we either seek pleasure, or we avoid pain. And knowing that there are tremendous challenges ahead and trying to get out of that alcoholic lifestyle, right to, to get clean, um, that's going to be hard. And so someone would could very easily look at that. And again, alcohol speaking, I want to avoid that pain and instead seek the pleasure in alcohol. So you're absolutely right. It's a mindset issue because now we have to force our thinking into saying, yes, I know it's going to be hard, but at the other end, there's going to be even more pleasure waiting for me. So yes, I have to go through this really hard next few months, but at the end of it, there's going to be much, much more pleasure waiting for me. And I guess that, that is something important to recognize for people that, yes, it's not easy. Nothing in life ever is, but there is going to be something better waiting on the other side. So let's talk about that in your own life. What does that look like now since you have gotten clean yourself? What What is that extra amount of pleasure that you have had as a result of your own cure? Oh, my gosh. Where do I start? <laughs> like... I, I take I take pleasure in waking up in the morning and just breathing and saying, oh, welcome to another day. Like it's, you know, I'm, there's so much stuff that I do that I take pleasure out of. I've started uh, meditations. I do journaling. Um, I enjoy nature so much. I just step outside and breathe and I'm, I can feel the dopamine rush in me. Um, Anything that channels, you know, a desire for for pleasure that way, like crafting, um, socializing, uh, anything that you take pleasure in that you can put your energy into is going to help you go from the negative to gaining that positive pull. You know, like you were saying about the, the two different, you know, motivations that either you're going towards pain or you're, you're going towards pleasure, but the pleasure doesn't have to be painful. The pleasure can be pleasurable. Like um, in, um, I've just started recently started a 12 week program called become alcohol free. And in that program, the first thing I start with is the whys. Why do you drink? And why do you not want to drink? And when you see that on paper, it's like, holy cow. Like, why do I not want and, it's, and you and you really like I really make you dig down deep right to figure out well why you know am I drinking because you know I'm drinking because Felix is drinking well no that's not why you're drinking right so out of that may come beliefs and I deal with the beliefs and out of the beliefs may come you know and the mindset as well so it really gets in there but if you can figure out your whys then you can bring the pleasure into your life saying okay well this is why I'd like not to drink I want to be present for my kids. I want to have a family dinner without a fight, you know, and all of these things. And if you, you know, sitting down at the dinner table with no cell phones and just a meal and all of you can bring so much joy. Just having the conversation, you know, just having a normal conversation like, well, I guarantee you that's not happening with anybody who's drinking. I certainly never did. And if we did, the conversations were never good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, not just in alcohol, but really with anything in life, it's good to know why you're doing something. Uh, knowing your purpose and knowing what you're working towards is so important. And I, I think the exercise that you're doing with your clients of actually putting pen to paper and writing it down, I mean, that really gives it so much more substance. There's some kind of visceral, visceral effect to that. 
um, that uh, you, you don't get out of just speaking out loud. I mean, there's so many times that I have conversations in my own head uh, that sound great, but once you put pen to paper and you actually write it down, uh, it's a different story. Um, but so besides all the good stuff that has happened in your life, there's obviously still some uh, changes, I would imagine, that have happened compared to your old life, maybe even before uh, all of this alcohol took over. So are there still days, for example, now where you you crave alcohol or where you have thoughts that, oh, I, I wish I had a glass of wine. Yeah, I can't lie. Of course there are. And I think as somebody who drank as much as I did, I, I think that's there. But what has changed in me, it's, it's a very fleeting thought, put it that way. And what has changed in me is knowing I have all of my tools available to me. I can play it forward and say, okay, if I have this glass of wine, I know I can't have one glass of wine. That's just who, how I drank. That's how I am. I know that I'm going to have the one, the two, the three, the four. Okay, so what's that four glasses of wine going to leave me? That's going to leave me probably to have a fight with my husband. I'm going to start picking on him about the house not being finished yet or, you know, the tools all over the place or whatever. My kids are going to get upset with me. Because I'm so I, you know, okay, then I'm, they're going to get upset with me. Then I'm going to get angry and I'm going to drink more because then I, I get the, well, you know, you're making me mad. It's your fault. I'm going to have another glass of wine. <laughs> so, so then I have another glass of wine and then it gets to the point where maybe I black out again. And, and I don't want that life anymore. I don't want to be that person that's out of control and wondering, you know, what did I do? Who did I hurt? You know, did I dance on a table again last night? You know, did I phone somebody and tell them off? You know, like, I don't want that. So I have all of those tools in my head. I've practiced them long enough that I can say, oh, gosh, I'd do anything to have a glass of wine right now. And then it goes immediately into my, well, really? You know, as opposed to not having those tools, having that thought. Then you're, then you're suffering. Then you're struggling through that day, thinking, oh, I just want that glass of wine. That's all you're focused on is that that glass of wine. Yeah. No, and, and you're absolutely right. It's, it's, a, it's a matter of retraining your brain to have that safety thought, if you will, to say, no, I really shouldn't do that because I know what that will lead to. Uh, and, and that will take some time, some training, because... We, we know that creating new habits and forming new brain circuitry to change the way we think takes anywhere from 90 to 120 days. Uh, so it takes that amount of time to start retraining your brain. And that's really what the power of coaching is to help guide you along the way to keep you on track, to make sure those brain circuits that we want to create actually will get created and you don't, you know, get something else uh, stuck in place. Um, so uh, how else has your life changed? Um, I know, for example, uh, my brother has lost not numerous, really, really good friends in his life uh, because they had offered him help. They had been there for him on multiple occasions and he still did not change. He did not change. He continued on his track, even though everyone was invested in helping him out. So I know he has lost a ton of friends. He has lost jobs. Um, he has lost opportunities. Um, that you know could could be probably rekindled, but it will also take a tremendous amount of work if he ever does stop drinking, which at this point, unfortunately, it doesn't look like he ever will. So, you know, what has that been like for you? Have you how have your relationships with friends and family changed as a result? Well, that is definitely a hurdle some people have to get through. Um, I have. I don't know if you know the old saying is, you know, you find out who your friends really are when something happens. And I have lost a lot of friends because I don't drink anymore. Well, were they really my friends in the first place? You know, um, <laughs> were they just drinking? You know, were they just friends with me because I was drinking with them? So there have been some relationships that have that have ended because I don't drink any longer. Um places I don't get invited to anymore because I don't drink. And for me, I'm, you know, and people just assuming that it's a problem for me that, oh, well, we can't drink, you know, we can't, we can't invite Christine because, you know, it's going to be a drinking party and she doesn't drink. And it's like, I have no problem with it. You know, like that's not it. Let, let me decide that. Right. But there has socially, socially it's been um, 
a lot of changes. Um, in terms of my household, I, I, all I can, I, I can't say that the changes, all the changes have been good in terms of my relationships in my household. So um, there's not, there hasn't been a negative side to living with my family at all. Um, my immediate family, my extended family, that's, was another issue as well. I'm, I, I don't live where my extended family is. And in my three years of this, I've, I've struggled with them. They don't understand the, you know, they don't understand the disorder. They don't understand how it works for me. And, oh, you can have just one glass. Come on. You were having a party. You can have just one glass. And it's like, no, I can't. <laughs> right. So, so there has been some adjustments to my family, you know, my extended family life, but my immediate family has been fine, but it's been socially, it's been more of a thing. And it's, you know, it's part of, I'm, I'm going to go on a tangent now here. Part of what really upsets me with the alcohol industry is, you know, how much they normalize it. You know, it's just so normalized in society that, you know, oh, you're supposed to drink when you go to a party or you're supposed to have a drink when you're, you know, cheering someone on. And it's like, you know, it's a drug that if they listed the harms the same way as they do on other things, people probably wouldn't drink as much, you know, like I, I'm, I'm a real big advocate for getting that on a label on, on the liquor. Um, but it's, you know, society just dictates. So it's kind of like they look at you and say, oh, well, she's the one with the problem. She's the alcoholic. You know, they don't, they don't look at a, at a, you know, at somebody who's, uh, uh, smoking to be a nicotine addict, you know, they look at them as, a, oh, well, they have a problem, but you know, it's whatever, but alcohol, there's nothing wrong with alcohol, right? <laughs> yeah. No, you're so right. Uh, and uh, just to come back to my uh, original uh, question, uh, I think it, it is really awesome uh, to have you share your story in such a way, because I think it is important for people to recognize that, like you said, alcohol is a drug. Uh, it's very destructive. Millions of people die as a result of it year after year. Um, and, but there is help available. And if you do the hard work to get free from alcohol, your life will become better. Now, there will be some challenges and there will be some changes, but your life still is better now than it was, even though you have lost people who you thought were friends, even though you're no longer invited to some parties, even though your family still has some strife within it and some struggles as a result, but your life still is better now than it was before. And I think that is that is an important point to make for anybody uh, to listen to this because we're not saying this is easy. We know it's not. It's simple, but it's not easy. Uh, but the, the hard work needs to be done in order for you to have a, a much, much, much better life, a much healthier life. Um, now to the tangent you went on, that was exactly kind of where I was trying to get at. Uh, society does normalize alcohol, right? Um, like you said, it's, it's everywhere you go, every restaurant serves it, uh, whenever there's a party or some celebration, the alcohol comes out. Uh, and I, I'm wondering what your perspective on that is. Um, I come at it from, uh, I, I see there are three things that every human society across the globe over all times has had in some way, shape or form. There's three things, three structural uh, things that every human society has ever had. One is some kind of spiritual practice, whether that's some kind of religion or something else, but there's some kind of spiritual practice about why we are here and who is controlling everything that we do. Uh, there's some kind of social hierarchy. Who are the leaders? Who are not? Who is in control? Who does what? Uh, and then third is some kind of mind-altering substance. Uh, I think in, in modern day North America, for the most part, that is alcohol followed by uh, probably nicotine and, and marijuana to some extent. Uh, but uh, you look at some of the South American countries, you're talking about ayahuasca, uh, kratom is huge in Southeast Asia. Uh, but you, you, again, it, across all societies, there's some kind of mind altering substance. And I think that is partially as a result of uh, defiance and maybe where you are in the social hierarchy, as well as trying to figure out the spiritual side of things. Um, so I think that's how I sort of see how all of these integrate. Um, so knowing that I think some kind of mind altering substance is sort of innately human for us to do, I sort of see how it's, how it can be normalized within society. The problem now is of course, we know in modern times, how destructive these substances are for our own health. 
So how do we how do we synthesize those two? How do we take something that innately as humans we desire, we crave, we 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 chase, and yet we know is utterly destroying us? Wow. <laughs> If I could answer that, I think I'd be rich. <clears throat> yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I, I'm asking this out of ignorance because I don't know the answer to that either. Um, I, you know, everywhere I go, um, and I, I used to drink a lot more in my younger days um, uh, as well. I would have never, I don't think I was ever to a point where I was considered myself an alcoholic. It was never a daily thing. It was more a nights and weekends, social event type thing. Uh, but now as I'm getting older, honestly, I've lost the taste for it. Uh, I don't like how it makes me feel. Um, so I have, I've really cut alcohol 99% out of my life. I mean, I'll have a drink here and there, you know, once or twice a year or something with some friends, but that's about it. Uh, and it's really not something that I seek out for myself anymore, not really because of my brother, but because it, how it makes me feel. And I, you know, it just, just not my thing anymore. Um, but, but again, I, I, I think there is some kind of innately human aspect of it uh, as well. So, uh, I, but maybe that is exactly where coaching comes in, right? That's where we can make a difference in people's lives individually, not not on a societal level, but on an individual level to make a difference for these individuals. And that's obviously what, what you do. So um, what does that look like uh, in, in your practice? Do you have a, do you have a defined program or programs? Uh, do you have, or do you do sort of a customized approach with every person? Um, how, how do you approach that with your clients? Um, it's a 12 week program, as I said before, um, it is, there's a basic, you know, there's there's a basic structure for the program, but it is going to depend on the client, um, what they're struggling with the most or in what areas it might work a little, you know, tweak this one a little bit better, or I might tweak that one. Overall, the program is set up that it works for everybody. And if they do the work, right, like you can't just sit back and, and attend, a, you know, attend one of my classes and say, okay, yeah, that's fine. Let's go on to the next one. No, there, there's 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 work to do for each one of them if if you want it to be successful. Um, <clears throat> but I think the only it's it's funny because we were talking about that. And that's probably the only thing that I haven't really included in my program is the whole um, chit chat about the societal view on it. I just decided to keep it out because it's kind of a can be an argumentative topic, and I thought it was a little controversial to include in my program, but. Um, yeah, no, it's it's pretty much straightforward for, you know, it, it will flow. It kind of tends to take on its own its own entity once it once it goes. It you will take out of it something maybe a little different than somebody else will take out of it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally. No, I mean we all have our own experiences, our own journeys, our own lives. So uh whatever experience we have, I mean, we could look at, you know, you and I could watch the same movie and have two different conclusions to take away from it. So absolutely, that makes sense. Yeah, I think for me, one of the reasons I, I chose, sorry, one of the reasons I chose to go down this path was because because once I finished my, my program, there were so little choices out there. There's, there's so, you know, other than, you know, AA is one of the biggest choices, AA and rehab. Well, most people can't afford rehab. You know, like that's an expensive, that's an expensive road to travel. And I was very frustrated that there was, there was very little help for people. So that's probably one of the main reasons that I, that I chose this path. Yeah. You bring up a good point. Rehab is expensive and I almost feel there, there are uh, a lot of rehabs out there who are doing it solely for the money. Uh, certainly some of the places that I visited, uh, to check out for my brother, I just got sort of got the vibe that, uh, they were more interested in getting paid at the end of the week than really helping the people that went there. Um, so it's it's good to know that there are people like you out there who not you know who, who not just care, but you care because you have that personal connection to the problem. You know what the struggles are. You know what that person is going through, and so as as a result, you truly care about helping that other person out. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the things that, at least from my experience, is missing from a lot of uh, rehab facilities who are just trying to churn through as many people as possible to make sure their profits align with what their goals are. Um, so 
you you said at the beginning uh, you work with uh, women primarily or women only. Um, what's your what's your focus there? Who should reach out to you? My focus is women. Um, I find I, I I can't say that I would turn turn anybody away because I wouldn't. But my focus is on women, um, primarily, you know, 35 to 60 age range, age range, but I'm not, I'm not opposed to working with anybody. Um, that seems to be the biggest crux of people that aren't getting help. I find, I don't know why, but I just found like, I found things for men more than I found things for women when I was searching for help. Um, and, uh, yeah. And, and I just, I, so I wanted to put off, you know, like I said, I wanted to put out there a different aspect for women, just something that they might be able to find. That's not an expensive rehab. That's safe. That's confidential. That's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, that is so important. Uh, that safe space, that confidential space, a place you can trust, uh, to get the help you need. Uh, so that that is very important. Uh, I guess coming back to the societal question, then, uh, why why do you think there's there's more stuff out there for men? Is that just our still historically ingrained gender bias that we still haven't completely shed, or where is that coming from? That's what I think it is. I think it's it's the fact that they think that men drink more than women do. <laughs> you know, the man comes home and has his drink and whatnot. So it's it's things tend to be geared a little bit more towards towards the male role when in fact the stats are increasing on women drinking um, versus what it used to be like in the last the last five years the stats on how many um, on how much women drink have gone it's gone up considerably um, but but yeah it's just I think it's traditional that they think that the man drinks more so there's more available out there for men but but I think you're right one of the thing one of the key things in any program and I did rehab, but I did it through a government run organization. So it wasn't, you know, I, I dealt with addiction counselors. I never dealt with people who were just running a wonderfully fluffy facility. This wasn't a fluffy facility at all. It was just, <laughs> if I can kind of say it, I'm going to say jail like, but no, it wasn't quite jail like, but <laughs> that's what I told my husband. I felt like I was in jail. Um, <laughs> but you have to know, like, I, I couldn't do this if I hadn't gone through this myself. There's no way that I could coach people on how to get sober. There's no way in green. Like, I know what it feels like. And I have the passion to help these people, you know, get out of their circumstances. So how you can go out there and run a facility and not know what's going on is that just befuddles me. Yeah, no, I no, I totally hear you. Um, well, listen, I, I think uh, we're done through all the hard questions here. <laughs> Um, let's let's paint some more color on who Christine really is. Uh, th these questions come out of my book. I wrote a simple networking toolbook uh, some time ago uh, that's, that's really re trying to redefine networking. And it's had a tremendous amount of impact on my own life in my, in my networking. Um, and, and these questions are really meant to get at who someone is and not what someone is. You know, if you go on LinkedIn and you connect with someone, you always see their bio and, and what they do, uh, but you really never get to know who they are. And so this is trying to paint more color on a person about the who and not so much the what. Um, so who or what is your source of inspiration? Mm. I think who? Well, I kind of like Brene Brown a lot. She's, uh, I've watched a lot of her uh, videos and I've read a lot of her books and she's kind of gets to the crux of things and I really like her honesty. So I think, I think a lot from her, there was one, one of her books in particular, Atlas of the Heart that I read that really inspired me. And uh, I work for, I work from the heart and, and it just, it was something I really related to in terms of, oh, there are people out there who are as passionate as I am. So, so yeah, I'm going to have to say Brene. I think that's a wonderful choice. Brene Brown certainly is a powerhouse when it comes to uh, our mindset, our thinking, uh, the way we look at the world. Uh, I mean, truly, she, uh, she's done some phenomenal work uh, in that field. So uh, I'll second that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on, on that same, on that same vein though, uh, what is your favorite motto or tagline to live by? Um, 
if you think, I know I always mess it up. If you think you can't, you, if you think you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Yes. Henry Ford. Yes, that's a good one, right? Either either way, you're right. That's right. Uh, that is so good. I mean, we we just kind of talked a little bit about that uh, yesterday uh, with one of the other guests. Uh, that if you say I can't, if that's your response to something, then yeah, you you won't. Um, but uh, recognizing that there are even recognizing that there are other people who have done what you're trying to achieve, uh, you know, proves that it's possible, right? And so the only one holding you back in that case then is yourself. Um, so I, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, what is a place you haven't been to yet, but really want to visit? Well, I'm going to say this, and I have no idea why, because for my, like, I've been trying to figure this out, but I want to go to Ireland. Ireland. And I have no idea why. Uh, you just, <laughs> you, I mean, first thing that comes to mind is like whiskey, Guinness, you know. So. I know. <laughs> um. From everything I've seen, from everything I've heard, it's a beautiful country, though. Um, uh, you know, you you brought nature up earlier. Uh, I think uh, from that from that alone, I think it's probably uh, gorgeous. Um, you should go. Why haven't you gone? I don't know. Just life circumstances. I think it's, it hasn't allowed me to travel yet. But um, that Greece is a really really close second, though. So. <laughs> oh yeah, you got it. You got a Euro trip. <laughs> I can see that. You got to do a year <laughs> trip. That's awesome. Uh, all right. Last question for me. And this is, this is an odd one, but I think it's a fun one. Would you rather have a cat that barks or a dog that meows? Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, I'm going to have to say a dog that meows. Why is that? Cause I like dogs better. <laughs> All right. No, that's fair. That's fair. I have three, so I have um, to say a dog. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So you're a dog person. That That's fair. That explains it. Um, all right. So you have one more question uh, to answer, and that is a question that the previous guest left for you. Uh, it's something that I copied from Stephen Bartlett's diary of a CEO. Uh, I have every guest pass forward a question to the next guest. And looking at the last few questions that, that guests have left for the next guests on the show. Uh, it's in interesting. You don't know who the next guest is. You don't know when we are recording. Uh, and yet the questions always seem to be the perfect questions for the next guest. I don't know how that's been working out, but the question <laughs> that uh, Aisha Toussaint left for you is if there is one thing that you can do before you leave this earth, what would that be? I have to help as many women as I can find their life, find freedom. That's beautiful. That's truly beautiful. I, I want my dash, you know, they, they say you're on, on your headstone, like your headstone, you got your name and the year you were born, the dash, and then the year that you died. I said, I want my dash to mean something, right? So. Oh, that's deep. That's deep. Well, all right. It's time for you to pass it forward. What question would you like to ask the next guest? Well, I'm going to pass the dash. Ask them what they'd like their dash to be. What do they want their dash to say? All right. That's awesome. Um, I honestly don't know who the next guest is, but I will pass that on to them. Uh, Christine, this has been a, just an incredible conversation. I mean, thank you so much for being so vulnerable, so raw, so open with your story. Uh, I mean, it's it's inspiring to hear that. And I think anybody who is in a similar circumstance as when you were, once were, um, is the ability to recognize that there is something better out there is just so important. Uh, so thank you. Um, where can people reach out to you if they want to get in touch? Okay, they can reach out to uh, my email at New Beginnings Inc. 2023 at gmail.com or my website at New Beginnings Inc.ca. Fantastic. And I'll make sure all those links are in the description below for anybody to find them easily and readily to get in touch with you uh, if they want to 
speak to you and connect with you and maybe hire you as a coach. Um, again, thank you so much. Do you have any final words for the world? Um, there's hope. Don't give up. Yes. Yes. I love that. All right. We're going to end it on a high note. We're going to end it right here again, Christine. Thank you so much for everything thank you've you. shared, everything you're doing, everything you're going to continue to be doing, uh, sharing your story. Uh, it's been an absolutely incredible conversation. Um, thank you. Thank you. All right. I really hope you enjoyed that. The questions that I asked towards the end are from my new book, The Simple Networking Tool. It's a great book uh, that redefines how we network. It's all about who someone is and not what they are. So if you want to get your own book, it's available on Amazon. If you want to learn more, there's videos about it here on YouTube. So you can check out this amazing new social science experiment. I'm so excited for it. If you do get a book and you do start your own, please let me know how it goes and what your experience is like. I'm working on the second edition and I want to make it the best one yet. So be sure to tag me, let me know how it goes. Thanks for watching.